the 4th of July, that special time of year when people come out to celebrate America and the ideals our democracy was founded on. But is it me, or does it seem like our political system is coming apart? There are protests like we haven't seen in years. Even our representatives in Congress can't agree on anything. We will occupy this floor. Is the system broken? Fix this mess. Do you think the system is rigged? I'm afraid the election's gonna be rigged, I have to be honest. Perhaps, but not exactly like he's suggesting. Holy f Oof. Fusion set out on a journey with an unlikely crew hey. to see for ourselves how the American voter is being gamed. We are the only democracy in the world that allows politicians to choose their own voters. This is the biggest political heist of the century. It's sort of like paint-by-number politics. Here's my district. Who are the players? I'm a professional. The rules of the game apply to both sides. I don't feel bad at all about winning. And who are the pawns? People should be able to vote. And how we can take back control of our democracy. That's why I'm running, because I know that the message needs to get out. We're losing our democracy. When you see people fighting, young, old, middle-aged, millennial, they say, we're not going to take this. It's our time! Are you ready? The journey begins where I first got interested in politics, my home state of North Carolina. Once considered the most progressive in the South, in recent years, it's become a conservative stronghold. And not everyone's happy about that. I think if you look at some of the things that are happening, you can see the need and you can see why it is important to get out and vote. It's good to see uh, Brother Josh Brannon in worship this morning. Stand up, Josh. He's running for Congress. Josh is a software developer. Josh Brown. Josh Brown, okay, Brand. thanks. Shy, no political background, not the likeliest guy to run for office. Why did you decide to run? You know, I saw all these people losing their houses because of shenanigans that, that banks had pulled, and that no banking executives had ever been prosecuted. So when this opportunity came up, when no one else had filed to run, I said, yeah, maybe this is what I can do about it. What's your name again? Josh. Josh, Josh Brannon. Brannon, you're yeah. running for? For Congress. Congress. Yeah, against Virginia Fox. Oh, oh yeah. you got my yeah, Thank you. Yeah, you thank got you. my yeah. I put my Tuesday, name on it. Tuesday's the day. I put my name on it. I have to. Josh is a Democratic candidate running in North Carolina's 5th Congressional District, which runs from the mountains to the center of the state. He knows it's an uphill battle, He's gay and progressive, running against a Republican who's been in office for six terms. I'm Virginia Fox, and I approve this message. He already lost to her in a landslide in 2014. And, voila. and in 2016, the odds haven't really changed. He says the district he's running in has been engineered for a Republican victory. My district is projected to, uh, to in any given election, vote roughly 61% Republican, 39% Democrat. And when I ran in 2014, that is exactly what happened. The lines of a congressional district are redrawn every 10 years to account for population shifts. In most states, the party in power creates the new districts, so they have incentive to draw lines that benefit them and keep them in office. This is called gerrymandering. The incumbent is guaranteed a win. The districts are drawn so that they will keep whoever's in the district permanently. North Carolina may be one of the most gerrymandered states in the nation, but it's neither alone nor isolated. Is it legal? Yes. Both sides have done this going back to 1790, except what happens in 2010 is gerrymandering on steroids. David Daly wrote a book about how gerrymandering is destroying our democracy called rat f That's political slang for dirty tricks. And as you might guess, it involves someone getting screwed. At the moment, it's Democratic voters, 
because Republicans drew their way to power six years ago. The voting map has now been dramatically redrawn. What the Republicans do in 2010 is use gerrymandering as a blunt force, a partisan weapon, in order to govern from the minority. And in 2012, the Democrats win 1.4 million more votes nationally than Republican House candidates. And the Republicans maintained a 30-plus seat majority. The same thing happened in North Carolina. More people voted for Democrats, but Republicans won more seats. How is that democracy? It's not. You want elections to count. Um, and when the only election that counts is the year in which you draw the lines, that's dangerous. Whoa, this is definitely not the democracy I learned about growing up. This sounds more like a devious game, and we, the American voters, are just the pawns. To understand how this game works, we decided to talk to experts, and not ones you might think. I think there's a lot of overlap between um, elections and gaming, because it's both something you're trying to win, somebody's trying to win an election, and you're trying to win a game. These guys are game developers based in Kentucky with the company HitSense. The election is this thing that can be won by these, these expected strategies like playing fair, grassroots campaigns, but then you realize it's actually about these larger strategies. It's about solving this puzzle. And in, in game design, there's what's called a foo strategy, which is kind of the thing you figure out you can do to win. Foo isn't like kung fu. It's No, F-O-O-S, uh, first order optimal strategy is what they're called. OK, so this is video game developer speak. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's do something that seems cheap or easy or otherwise unfair, just kind of predetermines the thing way in advance, like gerrymandering, change the shape of the board in your favor. I think sometimes people feel powerless in elections when you start learning about this stuff, right? Yeah, even if people feel strongly politically, they won't vote. You know, because uh, it kind of feels like, why would I? Right. So we want to build a game that puts the power to rig an election in the hands of whoever's playing it. Mm. So Fusion hired these guys to make a mobile game for us. And in order to build that game, the HitSense team will join us on our quest to understand the problems and how to fix them. I like where this is going. Mm. Yeah. If the outcomes are predetermined by Republicans, who clearly mastered the foo strategies of 2010, does Josh Brannon even stand a chance? We'll see. Or is his campaign part of the solution? I'm running because we need to get money out of politics. We need to make it so that everyone has the same voice. And we need to get rid of Virginia Fox to be able to do that. Thank you. We pretend that we have a democracy, but we really have a system where our representatives pick their constituents versus the constituents picking their representatives. I know that the message needs to get out, uh, that you know, this is a problem that, without exaggerating at all, we're losing our democracy. Republicans have packed so many African Americans into the district. It's called isolating the black vote. It's called apartheid redistricting. When Barack Obama was elected United president States. of the United Barack States, the, the historic significance could not be overstated. It had been a long road to get here. Nearly a century after being granted the right to vote in 1870, African Americans were still being blocked from the polls through state and local laws and violence. It was in the wake of the brutal attacks on peaceful protesters in Selma, Alabama, that President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions. The act was designed to give everyone an equal voice in the democratic process. This meant creating special districts so voters of color could form a majority and elect the representatives of their choice. But in recent years, the good intention behind this part of the Voting Rights Act has been warped to work against African Americans and other minorities. You create these districts, you flood the black votes in one place. It's called isolating the black vote. It's called apartheid redistricting. The Voting Rights Act was intended to give minorities an opportunity to elect their representative, but then used by Republicans to pack minorities into districts and dilute their power. Yeah. It's a little complicated then. The law wasn't bad. It was those who handled it. They abused it. They misinterpreted the law. Misinterpretation is putting it mildly, as we're about to see. 
Ripped from the comfort of their computer stations, our game developers Matt and Clint are in for a long and confusing ride. Fair congressional districts should be compact and composed of nearby communities sharing similar needs, according to the Voting Rights Act. I grew up here in North Carolina's 12th district, and compact, it's not. We're in Winston-Salem right now, and the 12th congressional district goes all the way from Winston down through Lexington, where I grew up, all the way down to Charlotte. It doesn't look like a compact district. No, it looks like a jellyfish arm that like washed up on a beach or something. Yeah, like... yeah, yeah you don't look at that and just instantly think fair, you yeah. know? North Carolina's 12th spans 115 miles. Driving through it on I-85, you enter and exit the district four times. So we were in the district. Now this part is not the district. The boundaries aren't physical locations or like areas or anything. No, it all it's looks just... the same. The faraway districts in this neighborhood have one main thing in common. Republicans have packed so many African Americans into the district. That's basically just to cram all the Democrats in one district. And in this case, race is a proxy for yeah. political party. In 2008, the 12th district went for Obama, as did North Carolina. In fact, across the country, Democrats swept the House and Senate too. They won, in large part, by galvanizing young, black, and Latino voters. In the aftermath of the election, there are all kinds of questions about the future of the GOP. Things did not look good nationally for Republicans, who were left to figure out how their party could regain power. A handful of really savvy Republican strategists realized something. They understand that perhaps the important election is not 2008. What they realize is that if they could win in 2010 big and then redraw the maps, they could hold off the Democratic advantage in demographics. This plan, winning locally to gain headway nationally, required cash to sweep state legislative races the big national donors generally didn't care about. What we saw really was an opportunity to bring national donors and show them that for pennies on the dollar, they could have a tremendous impact on the process of retaking Congress. Chris Jankowski is a political consultant who co-founded the Republican State Leadership Committee in 2002. The organization works to elect Republicans to state office. We went to donors with basically a PowerPoint and said, look, here are 25 swing congressional districts that over the next 10 years are going to be fought back and forth and back and forth. For $30 million, we can take those 25 seats off the table. They could do it by putting the money into local races and winning state legislatures, which draw the congressional maps. In 2010, there were barrels and barrels of money being dropped into these little local races that had never seen anything like this before. The Republicans raised millions of dollars from big-time donors like Charles and David Koch, the Republican Governors Association, and a North Carolina tycoon named Art Pope. We had an election where we set a record for any political party in history in the net gain of state legislative seats, over 700. That exceeds the water, post-Watergate election, which was the high water mark for Democrats, for any party. These were states that Obama had won that had complete Democrat control, and in a couple of them, we switched complete control, governor, all the way through. And that's what we had to do to win, and that's what we did. 20 state legislatures flipped for the Republicans, and their plan wasn't even a secret. Republican strategist Karl Rove, who declined an interview with Fusion, wrote about the project in the Wall Street Journal in early 2010, with this not-so-subtle subhead. He who controls redistricting can control Congress. The real genius of it all? To win, maybe they wouldn't need to appeal to minority voters after all. The strategy was called the Redistricting Majority Project, or REDMAP. If I were a Republican, I'd be lobbying to put this guy's face on the penny. REDMAP is the biggest political heist of the century. Chris Jankowski is a brilliant Republican strategist. He's able to pull this off because he understands state legislatures. He also understands how much easier it is to take control of these chambers than national races. What he pulled off is unprecedented. 
Democrats have also gerrymandered for decades, and still do. Maryland, with its democratically controlled state house, is currently being sued for its maps. But Red Map, in its brilliance, made gerrymandering part of a national strategy, one that people trying to run for office in gerrymandered districts are trying to overcome, like Josh Brannon in North Carolina. I like to call it district stealing, because that's what it is. There's no reason to rig election machines if you can simply redraw a map and elect whoever you want. We have created district after district in which elections don't matter. On the Democrat side. We don't like you. Learn some common sense. The president will find in our new majority the voice of the American people as they've expressed it tonight. That's the voice of the American people in mostly gerrymandered districts. As genius as Red Map was, the real artistry happened in the map making that followed. It's a skill that's very much in demand every 10 years. The pros use Maptitude. Hi, and welcome to Maptitude. Maptitude comes loaded with all of the census data. And you can break it down block level by block level, precinct by precinct, street by street. The program is about $700, but the pricey stuff is the information about you and your neighbors. They know how much money they make. They know what the voting patterns are on that street. Magazine subscriptions, social media. You have got a deeply powerful tool for being sure you pack as many of their people into as few districts as you can and spread yours out into as many as you can. Scary. And with that information, the pros come up with some real beauties. I wanted to give it a try, so we signed up for a lesson with a politics professor at the University of Florida and a consultant on redistricting named Dan Smith. Well, uh, we have pulled up for you the state of Florida's House Redistricting Committee software. If you're coders like Matt and Clint designing a rigged election game, you should know a little about map making. Yes, it's pretty easy to do. You just drag and pull them over. For me, let me, let me I just wanted to make my own dream my district. district. Let's pick up some in the Tampa area and then go over into Orlando and down into Osceola. Yeah, Orlando, definitely Orlando, because oh, yeah. that's, that's all Puerto Osceola Ricans. County, yep. Those are my it. people. Are you Puerto Rican? I am. Well, there you go. Yeah. You're in good shape. This is easy. For years, people have been trying to do away with this type of dream districting. In fact, in 2010, the people of Florida voted for the very first constitutional amendment in the United States, making partisan gerrymandering illegal. It was called the Fair Districts Amendment. More on that after our map making lesson. You could just lasso them over here. Yep, you got it. Okay. Beautiful. Wow. Is there any kind of like mode where you can get an average of those data points where you say like, okay, they voted Democrat last time. And if we go over here to look at our district in, in terms of the performance, if you are a uh, Democrat, you're looking pretty good because that voted 53% for the Democratic candidate in 2010 for governor. Here's my district. There's your district. Is there anything wrong with this? Not for me. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have easily won that district with voters I handpicked. It's sort of like the paint by number politics. Yes. But again, here in Florida, that Fair Districts Amendment prohibits lawmakers from drawing maps to give the party in power an advantage. So in 2011, the legislature turned to the public for help, holding hearings and encouraging people to submit maps. There should be no gerrymandering in this process. They said this is going to be the most transparent redistricting done in history. Uh, they went on a tour around the state, got input from public and elected officials. Pamela Goodman runs the Florida League of Women Voters, which supported the Fair Districts Amendment. The maps came out in 2012. We took one look at the maps, however, and said, wow, wrong. Didn't follow the mandates in the Constitution. Dan Smith was hired by the League of Women Voters to review the maps and see if they were illegally gerrymandered by the Republican-controlled state legislature. We found that in every instance, the Republican legislature, when had a choice between maps, took the map that was going to advantage the overall Republican makeup of the congressional delegation. So the League of Women Voters, along with other groups, sued the state. 
That lawsuit revealed the shady things politicians were pulling behind the scenes. It was so cloak and dagger, so the opposite of being transparent. Republican operatives had actually coached people on what to say at public hearings. One email sent by a political consultant read, the only thing I'm putting in writing is that it's important that we show support for the redistricting process. I only send templates to those who I've spoken, emailed with, and they know the mission and have agreed to help. I have stressed discretion to all. It was a complete charade. Um, and it made a mockery of this supposedly transparent process when really there was a whole shadow redistricting that was going on. Maps drawn by Republican operatives were even submitted under the names of private citizens. It showed what links they would go to keep drawing these districts the way that they always had been, how important it was to them. Boy, this politics business can get ugly. The Florida Republican Party declined to comment. Back in North Carolina, Josh Brannon is getting a taste of it on the campaign trail. I'm, I'm running on the Democrat side. I don't like you. <laughs> well, fair enough. You're young, have an open mind, and I pray that you learn some common sense. We'll say, we'll say. If you've got good sense, you will. <laughs> Why do we have to go through this suit? It's a waste of taxpayer dollars. People should be able to vote. By now, we're feeling a little depressed about gerrymandering. It's making our political system polarized and dysfunctional, whether it's a rat f like the author David Daly calls it, or a first order optimal strategy, like the game developers say. How can all this master manipulation be part of our democracy? Hey, oh my gosh. Back in North Carolina, I decided to talk to the first person who taught me about gerrymandering, Miss Ellis, my old high school civics teacher. Matt Clint and I are hoping she can clarify some murky constitutional questions and give us some tips for our mobile game. Are you the guys from Kentucky? Yes. Yeah. You can gerrymander. This is not unconstitutional. You just have to be careful right. a little bit about the way that you do it. So as long as you've got about the same number of voters, it's OK. Now, can they just be of one race? Well, no, that is not constitutional. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, when you taught this topic, what did people latch on to about it? Like, was it the sense that it was unfair? Yes, the sense that it was unfair. And I can just envision this game with a bunch of kids, and their job is to ensure that their party redraws the line mm, right? Yeah. so that they can win the elections. And get them in this flow state of like, oh, I'm winning. I'm doing all these things to win that aren't necessarily ethical or aren't necessarily fair, like voter ID laws, things that actually disenfranchise people. Yeah. That's another awesome. huge, huge <laughs> thing that's stacking the deck against poor people, minorities, people that don't have any way to get a voter ID. Turns out, gerrymandering isn't the only way to disenfranchise voters. Since 2010, Republican-controlled state legislatures across the country have passed laws requiring an ID to vote. And it just so happens that a lot of folks who don't have the necessary ID are people of color, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. Even more restrictive voter laws were passed after 2013, when the Supreme Court overturned a key part of the Voting Rights Act. Anita Earls is a civil rights attorney based in Durham. The part of the Voting Rights Act that was declared unconstitutional is the part that said any change affecting voting has to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department before it can be put into effect. They had to show that the new voting procedure doesn't have a discriminatory impact um, on voters of color. Basically, certain counties had to get approval from the federal government before making voting changes. Now, they don't. On the very same day of the Supreme Court ruling, a new voting law was introduced in the North Carolina State Legislature. They ended 16 and 17 year old pre-registration, they cut um, early voting by half, and they severely restricted the types of photo ID that you can use. Emails obtained by Fusion revealed that lawmakers had linked ID data to race. Here, a state rep requests the number of student ID cards held by African Americans in the state. 
All of the forms of ID that they kept were forms that are disproportionately held by whites, and all of the forms of IDs that they eliminated from the bill were forms that were disproportionately held by people of color. You have two minutes. The Monster Law, as it's known, was given only two days of debate and public hearings. This bill is voter suppression at its very worst. The law passed within 24 hours. Protecting the integrity of every vote cast, it's why I signed these common sense, commonplace protections into law. From 2010 to 2016, 22 states across the country passed new voting restrictions on the premise that they prevent voter fraud and protect the integrity of elections. This is the kind of fraud Donald Trump claims he's concerned about. I'm afraid the election's going to be rigged, I have to be honest. People are going to walk in, they're going to vote 10 times, maybe. But no investigation by law enforcement, academics, or news organizations in the last 10 years has turned up evidence that this is really happening. What is evident, based on a recent national survey, is that voter ID laws significantly affect turnout of the youth and minority vote, with real political consequences that favor Republicans. Another way to keep people from the polls? Felon voting laws. Florida is one of only three states where felons are prohibited from voting for the rest of their lives. They can appeal, but it's not easy. We're about to go to this clemency board hearing, and this is when felons come and they try to present their case to the cabinet, which includes the attorney general and the governor. The clemency board has sole discretion in whether or not voting rights will be restored, and the odds aren't good. I'm going to deny restoration of rights. The previous governor, Charlie Crist, restored the voting rights of 155,000 people. It was his policy to automatically give nonviolent offenders their voting rights back. But Republican Governor Rick Scott revoked the policy and added a wait period of five to seven years, depending on the charge, for felons to apply for the right to vote. Did you do it? In his first term, he only granted 1,500 people their voting rights. I deny restoration of civil rights. And your chances are especially slim if you can't make it to the state capitol to go in front of the board. I deny restoration of rights. Scott would not comment after the hearing. I deny restoration of rights. But his policies have made it so that one in four black residents of Florida cannot vote because of their criminal records, according to a report by the Sentencing Project. Lashana Tyson is one of them. The power of the vote, what does that mean to you? Voting is key. Voting is important. Voting is your weapon. Because no matter what, that's enough power to put them out of a job, to make them change these policies. Tyson went to prison for her role in an armed robbery, and after serving 13 years behind bars, got out in 2011. She still has two years before she can apply, but came to make her voice heard today. Why do we have to go through this waste of taxpayer dollars? People should be able to vote. I was going to leave. I didn't want to tell you the best thing y'all did for me was take away my one right to vote because I vote 26 times. I get my friends and family to go and vote for me. And if 11,000 of us do that, we can make sure you don't have no job no more because everybody deserves a second chance. Y'all are not perfect. They say, we're, we're not going to take this. If you want to get arrested, go ahead in there. Otherwise, you need to move back. They're not leaving until someone comes to take them out. We will occupy this floor. Remember the summer of 2016, when Democrats held a sit-in because Republicans refused to even vote on a gun control law? We will no longer be denied a right to vote. Chair declares the House recess for hour of 12 noon. For politicians who are all but guaranteed a win, there's little incentive to reach across the aisle. Frustrations of voters have bubbled over onto the streets at demonstrations, rallies, and conventions. And the divide just seems to get bigger. Our politicians are unwilling to talk to each other. And this is because we have created district after district in which elections don't matter. Out of 435 congressional seats across the country, only 37 are actually competitive, according to nonpartisan analysis. That's a result of gerrymandering. So since we usually know which party is going to win, 
The only thing that matters is the primary. When that is what our politics is reduced to, a primary election amongst an activist base with a really low turnout, we get dysfunction, you get frozen politics. One of the ideas is that gerrymandering is leading to more polarization. Do you see that? Do I think that having a majority built on safely districted seats gives a level of comfort to members of Congress and causes them to not want to come to the middle and compromise? Absolutely. Take Virginia Fox, for example, the Tea Party darling who is the incumbent in Josh Brannon's district, North Carolina's fifth. We don't have an obligation for wealth redistribution in this country. It is not our job to take from some Americans and give to others. And this is her on Obamacare. I believe we have more to fear from the potential of that bill passing than we do from any terrorist right now in any country. Fox declined our request for an interview. And she's seen no reason to debate Josh. But that's not stopping him. I get out and meet as many people as I can. I go to street festivals, sports events, like the, the kickball game today. That's why he's campaigning relentlessly, to convince voters that this time, change actually has a chance. How's it going? Josh Brannon. Christian. Running for Congress against Virginia Fox. Maybe it's the year we can finally get rid of her. Yeah. Here to that. Here to that. Yeah. Thanks. It's a supportive crowd, but one of little faith. The General Assembly is bought and paid for. Josh was inspired to run after policies passed by the state legislature took a sharp turn to the right in 2010. Like in much of the country, North Carolina's Republican-controlled state house passed increasingly conservative laws. States have also passed laws restricting immigration and limiting access to abortion. 22 states, like North Carolina, have refused to expand Medicaid. That's another reason that, you know, I, I got into politics because, you know, growing up in North Carolina, it crushes me to see them dismantling all of the things that I thought were great about our state. This was considered one of the most moderate and even progressive states. We talked about election reform, expanding voting rights, trying to get big money out of politics. Chris Crom works at the Institute for Southern Studies and has been tracking state politics and money for years. But every one of those reforms was fought. And at the top of the list, the groups and the people that were fighting it, it turned out were being funded by this multimillionaire uh, retail tycoon named Art Pope, who was a major conservative donor. Art Pope is a North Carolina native who made his fortune through family business, a chain of bargain retail stores. The Institute for Southern Studies found that in 2010, Pope and his family, and key groups backed by Pope, contributed $2.2 million that paid for things like direct mail campaigns and attack ads in North Carolina. What does Margaret Dixon really care about? Crom's group also found that of the 22 Republican candidates whose campaigns Art Pope helped finance in 2010, 18 won. Pope says he served as a legal advisor when the district maps were redrawn, maps that were later challenged in court. In the record for the case, it showed that Art Pope was there assisting the people who were drawing the lines. He really had no good reason to be there, but he was standing right next to the guy at the computer who was coming up with the maps. Why are you such a lightning rod? I think I get far more credit or blame, depending on your perspective, than I deserve. One of the first things Governor Corey did is appoint Art Pope as his budget director, one of the most powerful people in his cabinet. In his very first budget, he zeroed out this program for clean elections for judges. I'm ready to report to work. Thank you very much. Pope says he supported Governor McCrory's budget, which ended public funding for judges' election campaigns. With that source gone, judges relied on private and sometimes influential donors instead. There's a judge they call Paul Newby. He's got criminals on the run. Just as Paul Newby outspent his rival 10 to 1, and won the race. And when the maps were challenged in state court, you guessed it, Newby ultimately cast the deciding vote that the maps were legit. Justice Newby and the chairman of the state redistricting committees did not respond to requests for comment. Art Pope declined an interview, but told us in an email that he has a long public record in support of voting rights and against gerrymandering. You had the repeal of the laws that were trying to get big money out of politics, 
the repeal of the election reforms that tried to expand the voice of ordinary voters, and then you had redistricting, which drew the lines in a way that made sure there couldn't be competition in these races. And it just all added up to an environment where democracy really was at risk and under attack. After all of the devastation they had done, we said, wait a minute, we have to go to another level. And so on April 29, 2013, 17 of us went into the legislature on a Monday to challenge what they were doing. Extremist policies mm -hmm. that threaten health care, mm -hmm. that threaten the education, yeah, that threaten the poor. It was the spark for a protest movement that has become known as Moral Mondays. Almost every week, protesters meet here. How you doing, Moral Monday? <laughs> For what together? <laughs> the day we went with Josh on the campaign trail, the rally was against House Bill 2, the so-called bathroom bill, the latest in a string of controversial laws. You think we ought to be more concerned about bathrooms than all the bad bills that you passed? You must be out of your cotton-picking political mind. What are you trying to do here in North Carolina? Well, I think the, maybe the other question is, what are people trying to do to us? <laughs> and that really says something about what we're trying to do. We believe the heart of our democracy is fluttering now, is sick. And we've got to shock the heart of America. It's not about Republican and Democrat. It's about right and wrong. Yeah. The more people understand, they are saying this is not the direction that we want North Carolina to go in. Bring them, bring them. Repeal House Bill 2. Repeal House Bill 2. I'm going to advise you right now that if you do not leave this office, your subject could be placed under arrest. These protesters demanding to meet with the House Speaker about HB2 aren't giving in so easily. Just back a little bit more, please. We want to create we a safe perimeter. In there. If you want to get arrested, go ahead in there. Otherwise, you need to move back. So that's where we're at right now. So, uh, all the way down. They're not leaving until someone actually comes to take them out. When you see people fighting, young, old, middle-aged, millennial, they say, we, we're not going to take this. You know, that's hope. It's our time! It's justice time! It's justice time! Are you ready? Voter turnout goes up, things change. How's the turnout so far? Very low. Wow. Yeah. Carolina has its own primary today as well, but it's not for the presidential race. In less than 30 minutes, the polls will open for the U.S. congressional races. It's primary day, and Josh Brannon is hoping a lot of people will come out to vote. It was a pleasure meeting you. Was, that morning, he went to visit polling places in his district. Are y'all here to vote? Are you voting? How's the turnout so far? Very low, yeah. At, at my uh, precinct, when I stopped and voted this morning, I was the 13th person to vote. Wow. Yeah. The turnout was underwhelming. In the 5th District, Democrats are Josh Brannon, Jim Roberts, and Charlie Wallen. But it's the final tally that counts. What's the count right now? Uh, right now, I'm winning all the counties but three. Tonight, the victory belongs to Josh. <laughs> Josh knows it'll be hard to beat incumbent Virginia Fox in the general election. Thank you so much, everyone. This year uh, might be the year that we finally outfox. So thank you. But for him, even trying is a first step in restoring our democracy. I'm thrilled, uh, and I'm especially thrilled that, that the message has resonated. Meanwhile, our political parties seem committed to business as usual. They just want to get better at rigging. Republicans may have mastered the game in the 2010 redistricting cycle. And the Democrats' response? to amp up their tactics in the next round, according to Democratic strategist Tom Bonnier. What is the plan? In a lot of cases, it's picking up state legislative seats, and that's the clearest path, and that's the most direct path, and really what should take up most of the resources. Winning control of redistricting costs money. Democrats hope to do it in 2020 with 70 million, while Republicans refuse to lose any ground. They've uh, tripled the number, over $100 million, they think, is what it's going to take. And that's a factor of the cost of these races going up. For now, 
the initiative to make our democracy more representative is coming from activist groups in state and federal court challenges. Hope comes out of history, hope comes out of faith, and hope comes out of being involved in a movement that has refused to give up. The NAACP and other groups challenged North Carolina's maps in court and won. The lines for every district were redrawn, including Josh Brannon's. Reverend Barber and Anita Earls also sued over the state's voter ID law and won. Courts in three other states have reversed voter ID laws, and the same number of states have struck down or modified redistricting plans since 2010. Florida also got a new set of maps. Remember how Pamela Goodman and the League of Women Voters sued the state? Well, they won their lawsuit. Alternative maps they submitted were adopted by the court. Turns out fair districts really do help democracy. What we have seen are more people filing to run for office and a higher discourse about the issues because they're competitive now. It doesn't take elected officials to change. If there's something wrong with our democracy, the people can change it. Other states have taken redistricting out of the hands of state legislators altogether. Six states have established independent commissions to draw district lines. But what about me and you? What can we do? The one thing that can actually swamp some of these lines would be a massive voter turnout. There might actually be ways to unrig the system. The American people have the ability to change this. Voter turnout goes up, things change. But you have to play the game to beat it. Our mobile game developers are putting the final touches on our rigged election game. Let's play rigged. Let's, do it. Let's <laughs> rig it. So where are you now with the game? Show me. Made it more about puzzles and more about you finding the right way to move these districts so that you win. Mm -hmm. Depending on what team you pick, the objectives are different because you want your specific color to win. Show me what's, you know, what's this next panel, this next level. And I'm going to uh, change these. <laughs> so, so. Whoa. <laughs> but, it's like um, a panic button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's um, cool, though. <laughs> and so, if you're making a game, what do you take from real life politics? You're operating under these limitations, but you can still manipulate things to favor yourself. Mm -hmm. Submit. Mm -hmm. That'll move us on to the next one. Boom. <laughs> Mission accomplished. The power is in your hands. So here's what we propose. Download the game, learn how to rig it for yourself, and then unrig it by registering to vote. We made a video game, so now we're about to have bourbon. Bourbon. OK. Cheers. Salud. Salud. Here's your rig. Here's your rig. Rig it up. 